Okay. Look, um, first of all, thanks very much for the opportunity to lend one more perspective into this mix. Uh, someone listening and taking part so far, it's been, it's been wonderful and it's been fantastic to see so many people here. The perspective that I'm bringing to this is simply that of a resident, a long-term resident of Fremantle. Uh, my family moved into the west end of Fremantle in the late 1970s. We lived initially on Cliff Street in the Lilly Building. Cliff Street being the first street in Western Australia, essentially created by the tracks of the supplies dragged from the beach on the south side of the river across to inside the river so they could be ferried up to Perth in the early days of the settlement. A street also that in, when the first blocks were gazetted in this state, one of those blocks was on Cliff Street, which was given to the Sampson family for a trading business. The Sampson family, 180 years later, is still on Cliff Street. They still have a trading business. It's an incredible part of Western Australia and of Fremantle more specifically. For me and my brothers, our experience of growing up in the West End of Fremantle was one of playing in the tunnels and caves underneath the roundhouse, being on the roofs of the West End building, all the buildings. We had ways to get up onto the roofs from almost every street in the West End because we wanted to be able to escape from the dreaded paper boys who worked out of the, the news agency on High Street. We never met them, uh, but in our mind they were a vicious breed that we had to avoid at all costs. <laughs> and I can tell you that when you spend a little bit of time running, literally playing chasey on two or three storey high buildings, you learn very quickly to run on the nail heads. Now you run on the nail heads because underneath the nail heads is timber. And on the roofs of our buildings in the West End, I can assure you some of those roofs really don't stand up to lanky kids sprinting on them. Um, the reason my family moved to Fremantle was in part because interesting buildings were cheap, but more than that, it was because it was a diverse and an eccentric place. Now this is a time when, when Perth was a very, the suburbs of Perth were dead during the day. There were a shuffle of cars in the morning and at night, there was just that faint, sort of emanating, flickering blue of televisions, and they smelt like mothballs and stock cubes, and you just didn't want to go anywhere near it. <laughs> Fremantle, at the same time, smelled like drying fish and coffee. It was noisy. There was people from all over the world coming in through the port. There was, you know, you could hear that verbal linguine of the Sicilian accent being spoken on the street. There were Croatians, Aboriginal people, people from all over the world. It was an exciting and, and diverse place. Now, at the same time, it had some issues. It used to be when the sun got down close to the roundhouse, High Street had a sort of shimmer to it, which was the very fine shards of glass that the street sweeper hadn't been able to gather, um, reflecting the sun as it set. One of the games that my brothers and I, particularly my brother Sam, and this is no exaggeration, used to play, we'd play detectives. And we'd do that by following the blood trails from outside the pubs on High Street. There were more pubs than cafes, we know that. Now, while Perth was essentially a dormitory place, a dormitory suburb, Fremantle was a city of short blacks, muscle cars and murals. There were artists living throughout Fremantle. It was a very, you know, it was a wonderful place to be. A lot of that survives, but I'm just going to put it to you as a question, really. Are we heading more into monoculture again? Now, to me, as someone who has kids who are living in Great and Fremantle and who I hope will want to stay here and bring up their kids should they choose to have them, what I really hope for this city is that we find a way to recognise and build on that character and that we expand our focus, our heritage focus, from being buildings, which is still hugely, hugely important to protect, but to expand it to include our living cultural heritage. And for me, what that is about, really, it's about vibrancy, it's about diversity, and it's also about our connection to the sea. Now, we are a coastal town. We have a river, we have beaches, we have a port, we have a fishing boat harbour, I would put it to you that our city, if you're walking around our city, you know very little of, the, of that is there. So I suppose my vision for Fremantle 
boils down to a couple of things. And the first one is that to maintain that diversity and to foster that diversity, I would like to see Fremantle be somewhere that really focuses its thinking, particularly in forums like this, beyond just being about the rate payers, about the letter writers, and about the meeting attendees, as wonderful as it is that we're all here tonight, to focus on our whole community. Because our community is more than just those voices. It's the homeless people in, in Fremantle. It's our retirees and seniors. It's our young people who we need to find things to engage them in this town. It's our Aboriginal people. It's our whole community. How do we engage and bring that out? So I suppose the final sort of to recap really, my vision for Fremantle in 2029 is that being a city that places a formal value on vibrancy and diversity that can be used as a filter in making decisions and in planning. And thank you.